Right, thanks for coming back. I want to start with a brief recap of what I explained last time. I'm going to skip over the motivation because the fact that you're back here proves that, that it has to have been motivating to some extent at least. So I'm going to just briefly go into the definition of what an orthogonal spectrum was. Again, in this talk, G is a finite group. Although I sometimes may make comments about compact D groups, or sometimes somebody asks about compact D groups, but it's going to be a finite group throughout. And then we define what an orthogonal G spectrum is. So this is a continuous based functor. X from a specific topological indexing category O that I defined last time to the category of base topological G spaces. So this was a category which was basically where the objects are finite dimensional Euclidean you know, product spaces and morphisms are made from linear isometric embeddings, endpoints, and the complement of that. So they sort of simultaneously code how you can enlarge a vector space and the suspension coordinates at the same time. So the main point was that I actually had a precise and correct definition on the board last time. It's not terribly important that you have memorized this definition for what I'm doing today. So the main point is that such a functor gives you the following structure. So if you have such a functor, in particular, you get um, a base G cross O of V space X of D. So you just evaluate this as the inner product space. You get a G action because we landed in G spaces and the, the orthogonal group action are actually the automorphisms, basically the automorphisms of V in that category and they commute because you have a functor. Um, so you get one of these for every inner product space V. And one of the key points is that a priori, you put just a naked Euclidean vector space in here, but we will often want to put representations of the same group G in here. Then we have two actions of G, one on X and one on V through the O of V functor reality, and then we want to always take the diagonal action. So this is how, even if there's a trivial action on the X, so to speak, while we get interesting actions nevertheless through this kind of orthogonal functor reality. So it's also kind of clear that we really need the orthogonal actions in the indexing category if we want to get this kind of functor reality out. Um, this is an important, uh, slightly subtle point. And you also get structure maps as sort of special instances of some of the functor reality. So this would be maps from the one part compactification of an inner product space U, smash the value at the inner product space V to the value at the inner product space um, you break some V. So this is a vast generalization of the classical structure maps when you have a bunch of spaced spaces and suspension just as one of one to the next. And this would be all, this would be G times O of U times O of W equivariant. So where the G acts basically on the X, the orthogonal group acts of U acts here and here, and the other one here and here. And then again, if U and V are both representations, we're going to take diagonal actions everywhere, and then this will be a G map for the diagonal actions. So this is kind of the main thing to remember, and you know the rigorous definition was as this functor. Functor that's nice because then immediately you have the categories complete and co-complete, you have your dilemma, and you have easy constructions for new examples and so on. That's why this functor approach is sort of convenient. And then I discussed a bunch of examples. Um, so let me just briefly mention them again. There was the sphere spectrum. So I denote this by this math blackboard board S, its value as the inner product space V was just a um, one point compactification. I'm not going to repeat the structure maps this time. I gave them last time. So there's a suspension spectrum where you can put in a G space. Sigma infinity of A. A is a base G space at V. It's just as V is A. And again, the structure maps I gave the last time. I mentioned I'm the McLean spectrum. Well, you know, in general, this secretly exist for Mackey functors, but I only gave you the definition for a special kind of Mackey functor, namely a ZG module, a VM group with an action of this finite group um, G, and then the value was, or my notation was M tilde of SV, so this was the linearization of points in this sphere with coefficients in M suitably topologized. Um, so in this case, I also defined equivalent homotopy groups, maybe it's a good idea to remind you here. So the zero G equivariant homotopy group of an orthogonal spectrum X is the co-limit 
over n greater or equal to zero of maps from the sphere of n times the regular representation into the value of n times the regular representation, the equivalent based homotopy classes of maps, and the colimit uses these stabilization maps to so be formed. And then here, something that was discussed in the exercise session is that this is isomorphic in a specific way and has a ring to the Burnside ring of the finite group G. Um, in this case, we have that pi zero G equivalent of Hm. So I guess here we also want for a subgroup H of G, then this would be the H fixed point, and this is a little unfortunate because this H is not that H. This is the I'm with slaying H, and this is the subgroup H. I think you can handle that. Uh, I also talked about the volume spectrum, but let me not repeat this today. But uh, maybe most importantly for this in program and for this week is that the G equivariant state homotopy category. Is the localization. So my notation would be SHG. So you take this one category, this category of orthogonal G spectra, and you formally invert the stable equivalences. So stable equivalences, let me just repeat this in words. This definition also makes perfect sense when you place zero by some other integer. And you have all the subgroups. So morphism of orthogonal G spectra is a stable equivalence. If you get an isomorphism, not just on pi zero G equivalent, but on pi K for all integers K, and H for all subgroups H. Um, and then you localize, and this is the equivalent state homotopy category. Okay, so now I want to uh, go a little bit more into the triangulated structure. So, one of the theorems um, that one can show is that the category SHG becomes a triangulated category in the following way. So sometimes we like to say something is a triangulated category, but of course that's extra structure, so I should tell you what the extra structure is. So we need an invertible shift or suspension functor, and that basically comes from the points at level suspension. So one checks, and this is not so difficult, that the level-wise suspension functor, smashing with S1, you know, an object is a continuous functor. You can post-compose with some continuous functor from G spaces to G spaces, for example, smashing with is G space such as S1 with trivial action that gives you a new orthogonal spectrum. That basically means if you do it object wise and all the structure goes along for the right. So this gives you a functor from orthogonal G spectra to orthogonal G spectra itself. So you have to show that this preserves stable equivalence. And descends to an auto equivalence. of the stable homotopy category, and that is the shift function. So this is not terribly difficult, and let me even say a little bit about it. So there is actually a specific isomorphism that I call the suspension isomorphism. This also came up in Agnes's talk, um, which relates the homotopy group of some orthogonal spectrum in one dimension to the homotopy group of the suspension in the next dimension. So the, when you suspend, the dimension goes up, and it's really on representatives. You just smash with the identity of S1, because um, the sphere smashed with S1 is another sphere, and here we're defining the suspension level-wise. You just take a representative, you smash it with S1. There is a little bit to show that this does give an isomorphism, but it's not terribly difficult. And then this in particular immediately implies that this preserves stable equivalences, so you get an induced functor downstairs. And also showing that that's an equivalence is not terribly difficult, because you can pointwise do loops, that's a functor in the other direction, which is adjoint. Unit and co-unit are isomorphisms of homotopy groups and state equivalences. So this is not, not like a difficult thing. It's a bunch of routine steps you have to go through. Um, <clears throat> okay. And this is sort of for in autological examples where you, where you would expect the shift to come from suspension. Um, what are the distinguished triangles? In some sense, they're also the standard distinguish triangles whenever a triangulated category comes from topology, from some kind of spectra, but nevertheless, let me briefly remind you how these standard examples come about. So, the triangles arise as follows. We need a morphism in the category before we localize. So, the f from x to y, the morphism of a formula g spectra. And then because we have an actual morphism, and not just a homotopy class or a morphism in the derived category, we can form the mapping cone at every level. 
form the mapping cone object wise. I sometimes say level wise when I mean at every inner product space. So we define the mapping cone C of F at V as the mapping cone of the map, the reduced mapping cone F of V from X of V to Y of V. I and mean, well, that's just by definition that is X smashed with the interval 0, 1, where the interval is pointed at 0, so that's really a cone of the thing. And then we glue along f of v copy of y of v. You know, it's this picture. This is the cone of x of v. And then along here, we've glued y of v. Um, now we have to, uh, first of all, this carries a g-action again, from the g-action here, here, and trivial on the interval, and you have to believe me that the structure maps are carry along that is naturally again an orthogonal spectrum. Also, this comes with morphisms. With morphisms in the category of orthogonal G spectra before we localize. Um, namely, Y, it kind of comes with an inclusion, that's the inclusion of this piece into the cone of F, and a projection, let me call this projection and this inclusion onto the suspension of x, x smash s1, and that's basically, you know, if you collapse this part, then you can see x suspended secretly. You have to parameterize, you have to fix some identification of 0, 1 modular endpoints with s1, doesn't matter which one, take your favorite and use that, but always use the same, otherwise you get trouble with science. Um, and now, basically, the distinguished triangles is everything that you can get from such a construction by then going into the derived category. So a triangle, in the geocategorian scale, the homotopy category is exact or distinguished, I don't know what you prefer, if and only if it is isomorphic, isomorphic in the homotopy category to the image under the localization function of a sequence of the form x going via some f to y via this inclusion to the cone of f via this projection to x smash s1. And you know, it's the usual thing. I mean, if you had this week's uh, summer school, you know that cones are not from correlated in the triangulated category. And you know that you can't just take a morphism in the triangulated category and form its cone. So as usual, you have to sort of lift to the model, form the cone there, and then everything you get as images of such things are the distinguished It's sort of the usual game. Okay, so this is also, one of the things which I really like about the orthogonal spectrum model, it's completely explicit, the triangulated structure. Um, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, another remark. So, um, in the theorem that this is a triangulated category, it's not only uh, it coded this structure that I explained, but in there is also the property that this category is an additive category, and that comes from the fact um, that there's already a kind of additivity property before you localize. Uh, so let me just briefly explain why it's additive because the following two facts for all xi orthogonal spectra orthogonal g spectra the natural map from the coproduct of the functor to the functor of a coproduct i and i so i could be any indexing set of pi zero g equivariant of xi to the, the zero of g equivalent homotopy groups of the co-product, which is pointwise the wedge in this category, so this is always an isomorphism. Um, the, way, the way you prove that, or the way that I like to prove that, is that you first show that such a cofiber sequence always gives rise to a non-exact sequence of homotopy groups. And if you've ever seen the non-equivariant proof of that, the equivariant proof is exactly the same. There's no extra complication in that. So a cofiber sequence gives a non-exact sequence, and then for finitely many summons, you obtain this by lo just looking at split cofiber sequence, the inclusion of a wedge summon into two things, and then you need some like covalent filter, covalent argument to get to general things. Uh, for additive, we only need the statement with two factors anyhow, um, because this, in particular, you can do this not just for pi zero, but for arbitrary integers and for all subgroups. So in particular, this implies that the phenomenon map from the coproduct to the product is a stable equivalence. And then because co-products and products are fully homotopical for these equivalences, they become co-products and products in the homotopy category where they, this becomes an isomorphism. So this is why it's additive very roughly. And um, for this part of the story, if you've seen this without a group, there's no extra complication. It's the same, it's the same difficulty with a group. 
Okay, so there's one new feature here. Uh, this was the activate additivity, but I guess I'll return to that at some later point when I talk about change of groups. Then that's probably going to be the last lecture we we'll to do. So then let me talk about the smash product just a little bit. I would actually define it, although it's not clear that this would be a valid definition for everyone. Um, okay, so there is a symmetric monoidal product on the catalog of orthogonal G spectra, which is called the smash product, because it sort of resembles the smash product of base spaces, which is like the Cartesian product modulo the wedge, so it's a reduced version of the Cartesian product. So the standard notation is this symbol, which of course is not checked as smash. Latic doesn't know smash by default. It's, it's, it's a wedge way, I think what it is. So spectra G cross spectra G to spectra G. And it really is a construction that exists first without the G, and then if there's a G, then you just let it act diagonally. Um, so, you know, a G spectrum is just a G object in spectra. So if I give you a smash product for a formal spectrum and I have two G actions, I can take the diagonal action. That's what it is. That's, it's as simple as that. There is no like equivariant smash product really. It's the non equivariant smash product with diagonal action. Um, so what is it? So this is, this is the daytime convolution product. For a symmetric monoidal structure, on the indexing category, which I suggested we want to call um, direct sum because that's what it is on objects. So I'm, we're looking at functors from some category to base G spaces, which are symmetric monoidal under smash. And then there's a very general categorical construction if the indexing category is also symmetric monoidal, we're given a symmetric monoidal structure. That means you get convolution type product that was first considered by the category theorists A. And that's what it is. So what is the symmetric monoidal structure on the indexing category? Well, on objects, it's orthogonal direct sum. And on morphisms, what were morphisms? So morphisms here were a W and a phi, where this is a linear isometric estimation called uh, W. So this is a linear isometric embedding. That's a point in the orthogonal complement of the image. Let's have another one of these. And it's the obvious thing. You take the direct sum of the two points and the direct sum of the two maps. So that's a symmetric monoidal structure on the indexing category. You take the data type convolution product. If you know what convolution product is, this is a rigorous and full, complete definition. If you don't know, the main message is it's a standard category theoretic procedure that sort of works and gives you symmetric monoidal structures in, in general. And then, you know, if there's a group, you just carry the wrong use of the application. Okay, so the symmetric product has a bunch of features. I want to mention some of them. Some features of the smash product. The first of all, that it's nicely compatible with the suspension spectrum function. Um, so there's a natural isomorphism between the suspension spectrum of the base G space H, the smash product in the sense of spectrum of the suspension spectrum of another base G space, and the suspension spectrum of the smash product of the base G spaces, where of course this smash symbol is a different one from this, and that isomorphism has the associativity and computativity property that you expect. So in other words, this is a strong symmetric monoidal structure on the suspension spectrum functor, which is sort of a nice thing to have. Um, the next thing you want to know is that smash derives to a symmetric monoidal structure on the state homotopic category. And this is a point where there is actually a little bit of work to do. And the work, again, with the group is similar to the work you already have to do without the group, just that it is a little bit more complicated. And the situation is somewhat reminiscent of how this goes in the drive category of just a computer ring. 
Um, the tensor power of complexes is not fully homotopical for quasi isomorphisms in both levels, so you have to do something. In algebra, what you do is you argue either with projectives or with flat modules, depending on your case, and you show that every complex can be approximated up to quasi isomorphism by a complex of projectives or flats, and then for those uh, it is homotopical. And this is a sort of similar procedure you have to do here. You have to identify a class of orthogonal G spectra, which you might want to call flat, for example, for which smashing with them does preserve all stable equivalences, and then you have to show that there's enough of them, that everything is stable equivalent to one of those. This is basically what you need to do, and this is, does take a little bit of work to do all the details, but it's also not so terribly bad. And hence, we have a tensor triangle category. That's sort of the upshot of this. Um, SHG becomes a tensor triangulated category. But of course, what's really happening here is that when we localize not in the one categorical sense, but we localize in the infinity categorical sense, we have a presentably symmetric monoidal stable infinity category from which the rest will fall. And that's really what's going on, but not everybody knows what stable infinity categories are. And you're not supposed to know this. Uh, okay. Um, good. Uh, some more comments about this category. So um, the next kind of important remark is that the homotopy group functor pi zero g and even pi zero h for all subgroups is very nicely representable in this right category. So for the subgroup h of g, um, the functor, the suspension spectrum of the orbit g mod h, so I take sigma infinity plus g mod h, meaning I take the g space, the transitive g space g mod h, I add a disjoint base point, I take the suspension spectrum. So this represents the functor pi zero h so in other words, there's a natural isomorphism between morphisms in the G-equivalent state homotopy category from sigma infinity plus G mod H and some other orthogonal G spectrum X to pi zero H of X. Um, to specify such an isomorphism by the unit lemma means exactly giving a universal element, and that universal element can be described very explicitly. So this is represented by a certain element, um, EH in pi zero H equivalent of sigma infinity plus G mod H. And then the, the map from, I guess, here to here is evaluating the map at that element. And this element is given as follows. It's the class of some map. So I have to give, have to give you an element in here. So, so I should give you an H equivalent map from some representation sphere to the representation sphere smash G mod H. Already the representation sphere of zero does the job. So I'm just going to give you an H equivalent map from S0 to S0 smash G mod H plus. This has two points, the base point at infinity and the non-base point zero. The base point has to go to the base point, we only want base maps. And the other uh, point uh, has to go to a fixed point because it's fixed, but only to an H fixed point. And we're just sending it to zero, which is the non-base point in here, smash the preferred Coset EH, uh, also known as H, the identity times H. And that, of course, is not a G fixed point, but that's no problem. We don't want a G equivalent homotopy class, but that's certainly an H fixed point. So this is a very simple kind of an H equivalent class from a representation sphere to the same sphere smashed with the thing. So that represents a class, and that's. And again, the statement that this is an isomorphism is mightly difficult. It's not terribly difficult. So this I could prove in like one hour lecture if I wanted to with all the details. Okay, why did I point this out? Because this immediately implies that the g equivalent stable homotopy category is completely generated by the G1Hs. So corollary of this representability. So the first is that G1H plus suspension spectrum is compact. Compact in the g equivalent stable homotopy category. Why is that? Well, compact means the representative functor sends co-products to co-products. I already mentioned that coproducts in here are represented by wedges. Wedges are fully homotopic. They are the coproducts on the one category, so they descend to the coproducts on the homotopy category. And I also mentioned, I mean, this needs proof, but I mentioned and explained a little bit why this functor takes wedges to products. So if you combine this isomorphism with the fact that this functor sends wedges to products, you see that these are compact objects. Another thing is that they are also weak generators. Weak generators means they detect if something is zero, again, by this representability. If some x has no morphisms, 
from all the edges, all the demod edges and their suspension spectra together for all possible shifts. This exactly means by this isomorphism that all the edge equivariant homotopy groups for all subgroups edge in all dimensions vanish, so that means it's the zero object. So this isomorphism immediately gives you those two consequences, and hence it gives you the, the g equivariant state and homotopy category is compactly generated, generated by the by the set sigma infinity plus h is for all subgroups h and g. And of course, because we are here working with finite groups, this will be finitely many. So if you wanted to, you could match them all together and get a single compact generator for whatever that's worth. I mean, it's sort of more natural, I think, to sort of use them separately, consider them as a set of generators. Okay, wonderful. We have a tensor triangulated compactly generated category. Then the other things we might care about is dualizable things and you know maybe Picard like invertible things. So I want to tell you some information about those here. So the next thing is that um, sigma infinity plus G mod H is also dualizable. And this is the first place, maybe not completely sure, where it's really important that we invert all the representation spheres. Because if you want to show that, what you're going to do is you're going to embed G mod H into some representation, and then you will talk about the Abbey construction to get sort of the dualizability. And if you couldn't, if you hadn't inverted the representation spheres, you wouldn't be able to sort of undo this process, and you wouldn't really get a dualizability. So that's that's one of the one of the first, maybe really important point where we needed to invert. Suspension spheres. Um, unstably, um, finite GCW complexes are things that are built in finitely many steps for, from such things. The suspension spectrum functor preserves like six cones to triangles. So this also immediately implies that sigma infinity of A is dualizable, dualizable for A, a finite based GCW complex. Finite based GCW. Because you know, it's built in finally many steps from such things, and in a triangulated, in a tensor triangulated category, the dualizables are closed under two out of three in cones. So if you keep building, you still end up with dualizable objects. And that, of course, means we can now get more dualizable objects. Um, we can take shifts and in either directions of these, and we can close up under retracts, and you might wonder if there are more, and that's not the case. So these are all. So every Every dualizable. So first of all, the dualizables will be the same as the compact objects in the geocorrent state homotopy category. Is a retract of some one of these dualizable compact objects shifted up and down. You know, if you shift it up, of course, you could have shifted the CW complex up already. But shifting down, you can only do in the stable context. So for some case, that. And some finite, if A is a finite pointed GCW complex. So, this is one correct statement. So, in some sense, they all come from finite GCW complexes. Um, another feature is that a stable map between such things, if you suspend sufficiently far by representations, will eventually be realized as an unstable map. And that means that these things are also the things you can get from finitely dominated GCW complexes. That means sort of up to retract from finitely dominated GCW complexes by taking suspension spectrum and then these suspensions but possibly by representation space. So that's sort of the same class. So we have a relatively good control about what visualizable objects are. Okay. Any questions about this? Otherwise, you're going to get more beautiful properties of the GFU and state of the You're going to love it. What's written under my infinity AK? A finite point of GCW. Oh. Maybe you tell us at some point about these structures of this category? What, what is it? These structures? I can tell you now. I wasn't planning to, but. You know, I'm paid for making you happy here. Well, I'm not actually paid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now let me tell you about the T structure. Of course, you know, depending on who asks, I mean, you're well aware that to give a T structure, I can just give any set of compact objects and they will generate a T structure. And if I give some extra properties, that will generate a nice T structure. But I should probably be asking about the specific one that sort of I have in mind. So here is another comment: the classes of spectra. So first of all, all spectra X 
in SHG with the property that the homotopy groups vanish in negative dimensions but for all subgroups. So the ones with the property that pi h k of x is zero for all k less than zero and all h subgroups of g. This is like the connective part, one class, and the opposite one, the class of all spectra such that pi k equivalent of x is zero for all k bigger than zero and all less than h d. So this define a uh, the words. Define a C structure, but what is the word when it like you see everything? The iron and the coil? Yeah, yeah, the iron and the coil and this, what's the word? The adjective when they see everything, there are no objects that are in this. Non-degenerate? Okay. Also has a good adjective. Non-degenerate <laughs> T structure with heart. So the heart's supposed to be in a building category, the intersection of those things. So what is the heart? Well, first of all, what is it ontologically? It's um, the x such that pi k h of x is zero for all k non equal to zero and all h less than equal to z. So the things which look like eigen Maclean spectra, and they are eigen Maclean spectra, which have their homotopy concentrated in um, degree zero only, and then there's a functor to this. Um, which takes the collection, you know, I like to write it denoted by pi zero underlined, but it's really the collection of all the pi zero h's together with all the natural structure that they have. And I haven't yet talked about the natural structure, but this might come up in the exercises, or maybe I'll talk about it next time. These groups will naturally be related by restriction maps, conjugation maps, and transfer maps, and they will satisfy the axioms of what's called the Lange functor for this group G. So if you not only remember these abelian groups, but also the natural maps that they are connected with, and this is actually literally the natural maps. So all the things that are natural, homomorphisms in the orthogonal G spectra, then you land in G metal functors. And this is an equivalence of categories. So in that sense, the heart of this T structure is the category of G metal functors. And this again is where we needed to invert all representation spheres. If we'd inverted just the trivial suspensions, or maybe some representations, but not enough of them, I think, although I'm not sure I've completely checked this, this would still find a T structure. And then we would not, not quite get full many functors. We'd probably be missing some transfers. We'd have all the restrictions, but probably not all the transfers if we didn't have enough representations. And then I mean I've never checked this carefully. We might get equivalence to this like partial many functors or something. In particular, if we only inverted the trivial suspension, I think we'd just be getting coefficient systems. Yeah. Okay, John's nodding, that's already reconfirming. I mean, I only check this carefully, like in the most interesting case where you do everything, but it seems likely that um, this still works in this in the orthogonal spectrum model. Okay, did this answer your question? Yes, what, what are interesting places when we talk about interesting places? You mean of other... No, when you said you checked it in interesting cases. I mean, no, 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 I checked this case. Ah, okay. Where well, you learned everything. Ah, okay. okay. And it seems quite likely. You know, there's always a little bit... I'm working in a particular model, the orthogonal spectrum model, and then you, to be really sure, you want to go through all, all the steps. Even if some, in some other model, this is still true. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's not exactly the same model, but um, I'd be confident that this is what's happening. Okay. Okay, now, if there's no more questions here, I will talk about invertibility things now. So what I, what can we say about invertible objects in this kind of triangulated category? We can say, the first thing we can say is that now representations give us objects. So um, more precisely, the functor, now I smash not with S1. This is what I already did when I defined the triangulated structure. Now I smash with the representation sphere. So V is secretly a linear representation, finite dimensional linear representation. So this functor also preserves stable equivalences. And the way you show this is a generalization of why smashing with S1 preserves stable equivalences. This functor also has an adjoint. It's like V loops maps out of SV. You have the unit and the co-unit of the adjunction, and you can show with an argument that's a little bit more complicated, but not terribly more complicated, that co-unit and unit are always um, isomorphisms on all active variant homotopy groups. And that means that both functors are fully homotopical and they descend to adjoint equivalences on the level of triangulated categories. So this implies that if I don't even have to sort of derive the functor, it preserves all equivalences, so it directly descends, so this becomes an invertible functor. Um, is invertible, 
And I mentioned earlier that smash product with a suspension spectrum is basically the same as level-wise smashing with an object. So if you have a space, a base G space, you can take an orthogonal spectrum and smash it level-wise, or you could take the suspension spectrum and smash in the homotopic category, and that's the same, they're naturally isomorphic in the homotopic category. So this in particular means that um, the suspension spectrum of SV, and sometimes I just write SV for this and not write the suspension spectrum, so this is an invertible object, so this lives in, in the Picard group of this jacket and still homotopy. Okay, um, so in particular, if we have another one, we can take one and the inverse of the other, so we get a group homomorphism. from the real representation ring of the group G to the Picard group of the GF very scale homotopy category, which sends the formal difference W minus V to the isomorphism class of what you want to write S V minus W. And you know you could write this in different ways. You could say this is for example, omega W of the suspension spectrum of SV, this would be in the homotopy category isomorphic to what I mean. You could also take the represented function of W because that's really minus, that's really the minus W sphere, smash with SV. Or, you know, you take the two suspension spectra, you take an inverse of one and you smash them together. So this gives us a well-defined group homomorphism. And because we basically defined this category by, the, by inverting the representation spheres, that is one ingredient. And the other one is, if you do this without a group, this is all the invertible objects you could set. So you might think that this is an isomorphism. And we sort of constructed the category by inverting representations. If we did this without a group, we would exactly get the Picard group. So maybe we're getting the Picard group. This is completely false. So this map is in general neither injective nor surjective. So we have to be careful about this. So this map is in general neither injective nor surjective. So in some sense, we've inverted um, representations. So we added elements to the Picard group, but, but something else is happening. And this is the kind of point which I've sort of known as a fact for a long time. And when I was preparing this talk, I thought, well, I should know an example, and I didn't. So you know, between the last talk and this talk, I spent actually a couple of hours going through the literature and coming up with examples that illustrate this, and I want to share them with you. Not so much because you should remember the exact examples, but I want to give you a flavor of that it's not actually all that difficult to write down the examples. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really explicitly seen them before I now looked them up. So I found them by starting with some leaks papers on the subject, and then eventually you sort of get pointers to where they originally come up. Okay, so let me give you one example that is not surjective and one example that is not injective. I'm not going to completely check all the details necessary to see that those are examples, but I want to give you the examples. So this I found in Breton's book. Um, so this goes as follows. So you start with a sphere, the, the group is the group is two elements. Okay, how could it be similar than that? So you start with a sphere of the complex regular representation. And some rho c. So that's a complex two-dimensional real four-dimensional sphere. Uh, and inside we look at we look at a certain subset that we call A, which is just points of this form z squared z cubed for z in u1. So that's kind of a circle embedded into this four sphere. Um, this is going to be invariant under the C2 action. I leave it for you to check. So this is supposed to be the real coordinate, and this is the imaginary coordinate. This is how this is supposed to be interpreted. And then this is invariant, and invariant subsets in smooth manifolds always have tubular neighborhoods. So you can define an X by saying we take this representation sphere, this four sphere, and we remove the invariant tubular neighborhood. Invariant tubular neighborhood of this circle. And then the thing which is not completely obvious to me from, and there were no details given in this reference, is this is supposed to be homeomorphic to a D2 cross an S2, in particular homotopy equivalent 
um, to a two-sphere. And then the, the thing that's easier to check is that if you take the fixed points, the two fixed points of this, this is actually homeomorphic to a two-sphere. This you can check directly. You know, that's, there's a trivial end one on which it acts by the end code, so the fixed points is going to be a two-dimensional sphere. And the point that makes this not come from a representation is that the inclusion of the fixed points, xc2 into x, you know, this is homeomorphic to an S2. This is homotopy equivalent to an S2. It's an S2 cross a contractible space. This has to be three. So that's something you have to explicitly check. Now you think, could this possibly happen from representations? Well, if it's an actual representation, it cannot. Because even if the fixed points and, uh, and the underlying sphere have even the same dimension, so these are both two spheres, then it has to have already been the trivial representation. And if it's a trivial representation, they are empty, it's a degree one. So from a representation, you cannot have this phenomenon, and this is not destroyed by going to virtual representation. So this is basically such a thing cannot uh, come from uh, a representation sphere, but nevertheless, it's invertible, so this is like compact smooth manifold, so it makes a finite GCW structure, so it's going to be dualizable. And this x uh, becomes becomes invertible in the state homotopy category. Why is that? Well, that's something which I'm not going to have time to talk about, but this is really useful. Later today, we'll talk about geometric fixed point functors. These are symmetric monoidal functors to the non equivalent state homotopy category. And the criterion for being invertible is first of all, you have to be like compact, realizable. And then you're invertible if and only if all the geometric fixed points are spheres of some dimension. And that's the case here, because I'm telling you they're both two spheres, the geometric fixed points. So this is very roughly how the argument goes. I haven't introduced geometric fixed points yet, so it's not actually a full argument, but this is roughly how you see this is an invertible object, but it doesn't come from a linear representation. So that's one example. That's the example that this is not surjective, so there are in general more invertible objects and come from linear representations. And I want to give you Another example, which also found in one of from Dick's writings, but he attributes this to Petri, one of his co-authors. This was this. Now we want to find a virtual representation um, that's not the zero element in the representation ring, but such that its associated object in the state homotopy category is the zero sphere, the zero dimensional trip sphere with trivial action. Here's how we get it. So here we have to take the group C5. This is the simplest, I think, that you can take. Um, so we write C round brackets N for the representation of this group on just the complex numbers where this is the weight of the action. So where the generator acts by zeta to the n, and zeta is the standard primitive n group of unit B e to the 3 pi i over 5. So if, if it was weight 1, it would be the like tautological action, weight 0 is the trivial action, and so on. And there's really five different ones. And um, the real, rep so the complex representation ring of C5 would be um, the free abelian group on all of these five representations. But the real theory is always slightly different. So the real representation ring is isomorphic to Z, generated by the trivial one-dimensional representation. And then you can take C1 and C3, and you would see in a second why I'm taking these ones. So weight 1 and weight n minus 1 are complex different, but real equivalent because of the complex conjugation. So you don't really have trivial 1, 2, 3, 4. You only have trivial 1 or 4 and 2 or 3. And so I want to pick this. Um, OK, and now you can write down a map f from Weight three, direct some weight three. The point is not that you remember exactly what I'm writing, just that the flavor of the example and that it's not actually all that difficult to sort of come down. So I write one, two, C1, C1. So these are in isomorphic representations. So their formal difference is a non-zero element in the representation ring. Nevertheless, I'll show that their one-point compactifications will be equivalent as C5 spaces. How do we do this? We write down an explicit map in complex coordinates. So these are complex numbers, x and y, and we send it to x times y, x bar cubed, y squared. So how on earth can you guess this? I have no idea. I found it in the literature. So <laughs> first thing you need to check, and this you can do if you get bored with my talk, this is C5 equivalent. Well, remember, you know, the actions here are by weight 3 and weight 3. Here by weight one, weight one. So we have to remember how the groups act. They act differently on source and type. This actually is an equivariant map uh, for that group. 
So it's not a linear map, as you can see here. I mean, it's very nonlinear. Um, um, the next thing that's easy to check is that the inverse image of 0, 0 is only the point 0, 0, and nothing else. And this means if we restrict it to the unit sphere here, it's not going to land in the unit sphere, but we can normalize this into the unit sphere because it misses 0. So if you look at the map f prime from the unit sphere in C3, Break sum C with weight 3 to the unit sphere in C1 and another copy. By just taking xy to where we normalize, we take the old map xy and we normalize. So that's still a G equivalent map from the unit sphere to the unit sphere. And the thing that we then check is that this map is a non equivalent map to pass we want. While I raise the blackboard, how do you check such things? Well, I don't know how you'd like to calculate a degree, but you certainly have a smooth map here. And then one possibility is to look for a regular value, which is the point 1, comma, 0. You check that that is a regular value, and then you see how many pre-images it has. Possibly you need to count with multiplicities, but it will actually just have one pre-image. And this is how you show this is degree 1. And this is one possibility. How you show this map is a degree 1 map. Of course. So the, the degree is just as a non equivalent map between two three dimensional spheres. So in time, there are spheres of dimension three. So you have to check that f prime has degree one. And this implies that it's an equivalent homotopy equivalence. It's a C5 equivalent homotopy equivalence. Why is that? Well, you know, these come from smooth actions, so we have equivalent CW complexes. So we may test that it's non equivalent equivalences on fixed points for all subgroups. Well, why did we pick a sickly group of prime order? Because it only has the trivial and the full group. The group acts, acts freely, so fixed points for the full group are easy, they're just empty in both cases. And you don't know very I told you how you check that it's, a, it's an equivalent. So there's so few subgroups, you see it's a weak equivalent in all subgroups. And then we take the one point to take the unreduced suspension uh, of this, and this will be a map from uh, the representation sphere of two copies of C3 to the representation sphere of C1 plus C1. This will now be a base, the base the homotopy equivalence. And this means that we found an element, namely C, C squared minus weight 1 squared, which is non zero in the representation ring ROC5, which maps to zero. Well, it maps to the class of the sphere spectrum, um, which is the neutral element in the Picard group. So that's an explicit element in the curve. Okay. I, I always wanted to know uh, how you actually get examples, and now I do. Um, yes? Questions? Oh, I, so are you saying that, like, for G is equal to C2, there is not really an objective, or did you just. I think so. I mean, a small example is also for C3. Is that, can you confirm that, that it's objective? I mean, first of all, to have something in the kernel, first of all, as I said, Something is invertible in the G equivalent state homotopy category if all the fixed points, geometric fixed points, are spheres. So the first invariant, you count the dimensions, you record the dimensions of those fixed points. So in particular, if you want to have something in the kernel, they better have different, uh, they better have the same fixed point dimensions everywhere. Well, these two representations do, because you know the fixed points are zero dimensional and the whole thing is two dimensional. So they're candidates for that. And that already you don't have any for C2, I think. It's just the sign and the trivial representation. So you can't even build something non-trivial that's that doesn't match this. For C3 also not, because there are only two irreducibles over the reals. Over the complex, there are three irreducibles, but over the reals. So you also can't build this. So C5 is kind of the smallest group where even by just recording the dimensions of the fixed points, there could possibly be an example, and this is one. There is an extensive theory around this, and I think it, it quickly gets really complicated with a lot of early work by Tom Dean and Petri. And then later work, you know, there's one by Faust, May, and Kuhu, I'm not sure. 
Yeah, and very recent work by Achim Krause. So I mean, this a lot of this is understood, but it gets complicated really quickly about what this map does. And, and I mean, that already this happens for C2 and for C5 might indicate that it's complicated in general to understand this. And I don't think this is understood like completely in closed form or something like this for arbitrary groups. Yeah. So the best work I'm aware of is the most recent by Achim Krause, but it's building on all this earlier work. Okay. Make sure to remember it's not an isomorphism, yes? Uh, so this already happens unstable. This already happens, and it has to happen unstable. Uh, yeah, because, yeah. because, you know, after possibly suspending even further, you can always realize the oh. next between finite GCW complexes. Okay. After possibly suspending with some representation sphere. So every phenomenon has to already sort of be visible in some unstable sense. Yeah. Okay, more questions about this? Okay, I only have 10 minutes left. But I wanted to talk about fixed points. Let's see, I might not be able to say everything I wanted in those 10 minutes, but I'll try. So this is one of the points which was really confusing to me in the early days when I was getting into the subject. Um, let me move back a little bit to the motivation at the beginning of last talk. I said we want to study spaces with symmetries up to equivalent homotopy, and then the good idea is to record the fixed points for all the subgroups because that tests equivalences on GCW complexes. So this idea of remembering all the fixed points, but only as non-equivalent spaces, is very helpful unstably. So you'd like to have something like this stable too. You would like to have a bunch of fixed point functors to non-equivalent spectra, um, and then say something's an equivalence if you have equivalence in all these fixed points. And the confusing thing, at least to me, is that there's two things you could use. There's two sets of functors fixed point functors, both serve this purpose. One is called genuine fixed points, the other is called geometric fixed points. And for me, this has been utterly confusing in my early days as to what they are and what the differences and so on. And I think one of the reasons is that in those days, equivalent spectra were presented differently, like in the Lewis May Steinberger model. And then, you know, genuine fixed points were already defined as an inexplicit construction, and geometric fixed points were indirectly defined as the genuine fixed points after smashing with ETLP. And so I lost complete track. So in your thesis was this done the right way. So we should have looked at John thesis and not <laughs> Louis May Steinberg. Then I wouldn't have been so confused. So what I'm not now going to do is probably the same thing in our focus. But also in Adams' is um, uh, in Adams is prerequisites. You know, pre yeah, yeah. Somehow, you know, when I was young, all the talks were given by Peter and his students, and I was utterly confused about this one. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm gonna take you into the orthogonal spectrum model of these are and one. But are they called general fixed points or categorical fixed points? I think categorical fixed points is bad because in orthogonal G spectra there is a categorical fixed point functor and that's not what it is. I think categorical fixed some people call it that. I think it's bad terminology. Because whenever the thing comes from one category called categorical model, there's probably going to be a fixed point functor. And that's not what it is. It's not in my model. Okay, so I'm gonna define two functors. I'm sort of slowly running out of time, but I have which will be two functors, very explicit from orthogonal spectra with a G to orthogonal spectra without a G. Um, they are going to be fully homotopical, so they're going to take stable equivalences with a G to stable equivalences without the G, and here they are. Uh, I'm going to give you to them to you level-wise and not tell you what the structure maps are, but the structure maps are pretty easy. Just sit down and think what could the structure maps possibly be, and that's basically only one thing that could be, that's what they are. Um, so the, what I like to call genuine fixed points, which some people call um, categorical, I think that's not the name. And there's the um, geometric fixed points, which I call phi G. So I put in an orthogonal G spectrum and I have to spit out a non equivalent spectrum, so I have to tell you what the value of V is. And this is just the following you take XV. You know, categorical fixed points, you might think I take the G fixed points of that, and that gives an orthogonal spectrum. And that can be used to define this. That function is not fully homotopical, but if you suitably derive it in some model structure, it gives something equivalent, but there's a much better function. So instead, we do the following. As, uh, I take V, tensor, the regular representation, and I take G equivalent maps from V tensor, the reduced regular representation, which is like the complement of the fixed points. So this is an orthogonal spectrum. I have to tell you how I get from this to the next one. And it's basically the difference between the reduced and the unreduced is a one-dimensional trivial representation. Tensor with V, the difference between what's here and here is exactly one copy of V. That's why the suspension maps map out the right way. So they have natural structure maps. And then there's another one, which I call the geometric fixed points. And 
this is just, I take x, I don't evaluate it at v and take fixed points, but I evaluate it at v tends to the regular representation and take fixed points. And this will also naturally be an orthogonal spectrum. There's also a map in this direction, which turns out to be a natural transformation of functors, which is important. Namely, if I have an element in here, so that's a g equivariant based continuous map from this space to this space. How many g fixed points does this have? Well, the reduced regular representation only has zero as its fixed point. When we want to compactify, it has zero and infinity as its fixed point. That's still the same if we tensor with V, which has a trivial action. We don't want to evaluate at infinity. That's the base point, because that gets us the base point. But then there's this other isolated fixed point, and we just evaluate at that. So if I evaluate at the other non-base point, isolated fixed point in here, I get a fixed point in here, so something in here, and that's actually a natural morphism that plays in the um, Okay, then there's a bunch of things to check. Um, it is relatively easy to see why this functor preserves stable equivalence, and that comes from the following natural isomorphism. So I'm going to do a little calculation, which is not a completely rigorous calculation because I didn't tell you what the structure maps are, and of course they play a role when we stabilize, but it works out with the structure map. So suppose we wanted to calculate the non-equivalent zeroth homotopy group of this fixed point spectrum. What do we need to do? Well, we have to look at the definition, and the, the definition would be co-limit over n rated equal to zero, and then I have to take n times the regular representation of the trivial group, where that's r to the n, um, into the value of this thing which I write here, net star g um, of s r to the n tensor rho g reduced into x of r to the n tensor rho g not reduced, and then g equivalent up. So here I'm just expanding definitions. Um, outside I take non-equivalent, inside I take equivalent. But now we can adjoin this. This is isomorphic to the co-limit in n. By adjoining this thing over, um, and then we have to get uh, g equivalent homotopy classes of maps. So this becomes maps from Rn direct sum Rn tensor rho g reduced into x of Rn tensor rho g. And now it becomes g equivalent. So here there was no g, the, the g was here. And when we join it, it sort of moves outside. g equivalent based maps. But now you can see why we put the reduced regular representation here. If I add another Rn to this, this is just Rn tensor the regular representation. So this is the same coordinate and greater equal to zero of S Rn tensor rho g. Well, I used to earlier write this as n times rho g, and the value of x n times rho g, and now g equivalent maps. And this was by definition pi zero g equivalent of x. So we've I've exhibited to you a natural isomorphism between the non-equivalent homotopy group of the fixed point spectrum and the equivalent homotopy group of the original spectrum. So in some sense, you are taking fixed points and then non-equivalent homotopy groups. This is kind of motivating why it's that. So this was for G, but G didn't play a role. It's true for all the H's, all subgroups. So it holds for all integers K also. So this is in particular showing that equivalent equivalents are taken to non-equivalent equivalents. This is what is from this. Okay. Um, for the geometric fixed point functor, the argument that I know is a little bit longer because you first have to show if you have an equivalent equivalence and you smash it with a finite, with a not necessarily finite GCW complex, it remains an equivalent equivalence. And that's, I don't know, maybe you have to show it. I don't think it's completely obvious. Um, and then you have to show that the geometric fixed points have this interpretation as the genuine fixed points smash a particular space, this is called E tilde compound subgroups, whatever it is. So it's, I don't know, a similarly fast proof that geometric fixed points preserve all equivalences, but also it's not like an unsurmountable difficulty. Um, Almost out of time, so let me just wrap up with the most important statements about these two kinds of fixed points. And then, then I'll finish. So, the first of all is know, let me just call it a theorem. So, Fh and phi h as functors from orthogonal G spectra to orthogonal spectra preserve stable equivalences. 
for all h less than equal to g. So you can derive them to functors on the respective homotopy categories easily without, you don't have to derive them, they just descend. The next thing is the collection of all these functors, h and g, detects stable equivalences. So if a morphism in the g stable homotopy category gives you non-equivalent equivalences for all these fixed points vector, then it was already an equivalent equivalence. And the same is true also for the collection of uh, geometric fixed points. Now, you might think that this could be proved by exhibiting a simple relationship between FH and phi H, and that's not what's the case. The, the relationship of the individual geometric and uh, genuine fixed point functors is slightly complicated. I mean, there's this one formula, the geometric fixed points you can get by first smashing with a particular space and then taking genuine fixed points, but I still think this is a relatively complicated relationship. There's no simple, like the homotopy groups is this, is not, as far as I know, in any way a function of the homotopy groups in this or the other way around. So you have two different sets of fixed point functors that both can serve to detect the equivalences, and this is extremely convenient because in practice, when you want to show something is an equivalent equivalence, in many, many cases, you do one of the two. Either it's easy to identify the genuine fixed points or the genuine homotopy groups and you use that method, or it's easy to identify the geometric fixed points and you use that method to show it. So these are the two methods, and roughly in half of the cases, sort of they really work. So it's really convenient to have these two criteria. Um, this functor is particularly con convenient because it's strong symmetric model. Strong symmetric monoidal. So the H geometric fixed points of X smash the H geometric fixed points of Y come already at the one category the level with an easy to write down natural transformation that makes it next symmetric monoidal at the one category level. Um, the factor derives easily, the smash product doesn't, but when you derive this to the homotopy category, this becomes an isomorphism in SH, in the usual state homotopy category. For the geometric fixed points, there's only a less symmetric monoidal structure. So there is a map like this, which again, you can easily define already at the one category to level. Then you have to argue by co replacement that it descends. But this is not, not an equivalence in the one category level, and not an isomorphism on, uh, on the derived level. So this is useful because immediately you see that like ring objects go to ring objects. But this is in its sense, much more useful. For example, this is why you can use this to detect invertibility. Clearly, if something is invertible, then it'd still be invertible. And because these functors also jointly detect, that's almost the proof that invertibility on compact objects is detected by these functors. Okay, I'm out of time, so I'd better stop here and thank you for your attention.